Hello viewers, I did my aboriginal film review on Atta Narjwat the Fast Runner, directed by Zacharias Kunuk and starring Natar Ungalak, Sylvia Ivalu, and Peter Henry Arnatsiak. Now you're all probably wondering why I decided to do a movie that was nearly three hours long when I could have watched the last hour of Smoke Signals. Well, I don't have an answer to that, sorry. So you can get a better understanding of the setting of this film. It takes place in a glue leak and after a bit of research I found out that that was in the Eastern Arctic. And uh, the time period is around the starting of the first millennium, according to my research as well. The main characters in this film include the title character Atanarjwat, his brother Amakjwat, their father Tulimak, um, Atanarjwat's son Kumaguk, Atanarjwat's two wives Atwat and Pooja, um, Amakjwat's wife uh, Uluriak, and there's also Oki who is Atanarjwat's rival, Sauri who is Oki's father, um, Kumaguk there's another Kumakuk, um, this time it's Oki's grandfather, and uh, Kumakuk's brother, Kulitali. The best way to put it is, well, there's a lot of characters. So you can get a better understanding of how the family tree looks like in this movie. I made one off this online program, so here's Atta Narjwat's side. And Pooja's side. If you explore it further, So hopefully this is not too confusing. Just some quick facts before I get on with the summary. I would primarily consider this film a drama with a bit of romance and action intertwined. Uh, this film was released in 2001 and it did very well at the Toronto International Film Festival and several other festivals. It won several awards and um, it was highly praised by most critics and it also happens to be R-rated mostly because of nudity. This entire movie is in the Inuktitut language and I had to watch it with English subtitles. So now to give a sort of quick summary of this nearly three hour long film. Uh, the film starts off mostly uh, when Atanarjwa and Amakjwa are kids and um, an evil shaman visits their igloo and it apparently infests everyone around with its uh, evil and um, what happens is that uh, Sauri commands a visitor to the tent to kill his father when both of them will get into a wrestling match. And it, it was supposed to be a friendly wrestling match, but the visitor did kill um, Sauri's dad, Kumagluk, who is the chief, which makes uh, Sauri chief. And... Um, Later on we see that Atanarjwat has grown up and um, him and his rival Oki are going for Atwat. Both of them want to marry her and they both get into a wrestling match and uh, Atanarjwat wins and eventually he marries Atwat. So Atanarjwat goes out for his seasonal caribou hunt and uh, he ends up visiting Oki's camp and Sari and Pooja are there. So Atanarjwat is eventually accompanied by Pooja for his caribou hunt and they end up marrying. Apparently it was the custom back then for uh, caribou hunters to have two wives. So eventually, uh, well later on there's a scene where um, Atanarjwa, his two wives, Amakjwak and um, his wife Uluriak, all five of them are sleeping in a tent and um, Amakjwak ends up uh, having sex with Pooja and um, the others in the tent end up finding out and this enrages everyone and it apparently uh, sort of breaks up the family that they're hoping to build and um, Pooja uh, runs back to her own uh, tent and says to her family that Atanarjwa tried to kill her and um, she goes back and uh, all of her old family end up forgiving her for what she did. So Oki ends up getting very mad and his jealousy reaches a breaking point. Mostly mad at the fact at how Atanarjwa and Amakjwak um, get away with anything they do, no matter how bad it is. Especially considering how Atanarjwa almost tried to 
um, kill his sister. So Oki and his gang, which consists of two others, decide to attack a Makjuak and a Atanarjuak while they are uh, asleep in their tent and no one else is around. So they end up killing a Makjuak, but uh, since they were attempting to spear them underneath a tent, they couldn't see um, uh, Atanarjuak. So Atanarjuak bursts out of the tent and he goes on a long run across the ice, but he's naked and barefoot. So he ends up spotting uh, Kuli Talik's camp and uh, they agree to hide him. So Oki eventually comes by, but uh, they can't see Atanarjuat anywhere around in the camp. Oki eventually returns to his camp at Iglulik and he asks his father Sauri if he could um, marry Atwat, but he doesn't get his father's permission to do so. So at some later time, him and his gang eventually pin down Atwat and he rapes her. Uh, then Oki comes back to his camp at some time after and he stabs his father with his father's hunting knife, but he claims that his father tripped over his own knife. And later, it's a funeral prose procession for his dad. Um, Oki is declared chief of the camp, and he begins ruling the camp, but uh, kind of in a cruel manner, and no one is happy. So, Panic Pack, one of the older members, and uh, Oki's, who's Oki's grandmother, calls for help and she contacts Kuli Talik, her brother, who is the man who's currently hiding um, Atanarjwat. And uh, Kuli Talik tells Atanarjwat that he must return to the camp and Atanarjwat eventually does. Once he's at the camp, Atanarjwat reunites with Atwat, but at the same time, he humiliates Pooja by partially stripping her. Uh, Atanarjwa eventually invites Oki and his gang for a feast in an igloo he made that is covered in ice on the floor. And uh, in the middle of their feast, Atanarjwa leaves and he comes back and challenges all three to a duel. He defeats all three in the duel and all four of them come out only to see that the community has gathered around the igloo. Later that day, the entire community gathers in an igloo for a meeting. And that's when Kuli Talik, who happens to be there, he calls over for uh, the evil spirit to return, and the spirit does return. Kuli Talik and Panic Pack both defeat the spirit, so that in the hopes that the evil would be gone forever. Uh, later on, Panic Pack says that um, Oki, Puja, and their accomplices are forgiven for all the sins that they have committed. But at the same time, she says that. Um, Oki and Pooja have to leave the community forever and never return. So, uh, just as they, just after they leave, uh, the spirit of Kumaglak, who is uh, Sari's father, Oki's uh, grandfather, and Panic Pack's husband, uh, he tells Panic Pack to sing his song, and the community gathers in this, and they all sing Kumaglak's old song, and the movie ends like this. So now that I'm finished boring you with my so-called summary, I'll get on with a more critical analysis of this film. Um, so to start this off, I'll talk about the soundtrack. So first of all, so you can know the budget of this film was uh, just under $2 million, so it didn't really get the Hollywood treatment. And this is sort of evident in some parts of the soundtrack, uh, like this little bit at the around the fifth minute of the film. <laughs> This music had me momentarily convinced that I was watching a B movie. Like, just imagine it if it was being used in a Hollywood movie. I 
cross my fingers and hope that this score wouldn't appear for the rest of the movie, and luckily it almost didn't. Instead, the soundtrack took a much more serious tone in respect to the movie for the rest of the film. Just check out this bit on Atanajwat's run, the defining scene of the movie. Quite epic, isn't it? I found that the music there was very effective in building up the suspense to the film's defining scene. <laughs> Some points the soundtrack got the intended reaction from the audience, and at other points it didn't. Just like the soundtrack, I believe that the cinematography of this movie has had its up and down moments. One of the down moments is... Well, see it for yourself. The cameraman's shadow, really. A big topic in this movie is community and collectivity and how if one person in a community fails, everyone else fails and if one person in that community succeeds and everyone else succeeds. And I think that the cinematographer captures this aspect of this movie brilliantly. Just check out the last scene of this movie. <laughs> Cohen's effective use of close-ups and dark lighting effectively portrays the community standing together to the evilness that they are so used to facing before. I also like how the cameraman never directly positions the camera right in front of the actor's face but rather puts it in an angle. Sort of acts like a failsafe in case the actor does end up looking into the camera. There's also the aspect of the scenery. The scenery might be the most highly praised aspect of this movie from other critics. And I can sort of see why. This movie mostly had a low budget, but I was taken aback by how good some of the shots were in the Arctic wilderness. First 40 minutes were shot during the winter time. So uh, the entire ground was covered in snow and I was hoping that I wouldn't have to endure this for another two hours and luckily uh, there were some parts of the movie later on that took place in the summer in the Arctic and we could see the beauty of the tundra. One badly done aspect of this movie is symbolism. There isn't much symbolism and when there is symbolism it doesn't feel very symbolic. I'm going to step out on a limb and say that the egg is a symbol in this movie. Now it may sound ridiculous but I think this movie had a sort of what came first the chicken or the egg aspect to it and I'll explain to you why. It's really tough to see who really started the rivalry between Atanarjwa and Oki. Sort of in the way that no one knows what came first between the chicken and the egg. I think, I think that the egg is representative of Atanarjwa and the chicken or a bird of prey uh, represents Oki. 
The egg, in a sense, represents fertility and, in a way, how Atanarjwa finds ways to um, give birth to uh, new notions of good to his community. The shell of the egg sort of represents how Atanarjwa protects himself and how he doesn't get influenced by notions of evil. Prey are also seen throughout this movie and we can sort of make out the fact that they are symbolically representing Oki and how he tries to feed on everyone else. Not literally, of course, but uh, he tries to uh, manipulate others and try to make them follow his ways and also how he eventually ends up killing a Makjuak and he tries uh, hunting for Atanarj Atanarjwa, so he represents that aspect of the bird of prey as well. Now to study the symbols of the bird and the egg in a particular scene, uh, we'd have to look at the scene where uh, after Atanarjwa makes his long run, he finds Kuli Talik and he resides with him for a while and eventually uh, Oki comes by but Atanarjwa is hidden by Kuli Talik. Talik eventually asks Oki if he is Pani Pak's grandson and at that point Oki threatens Kuli Talik with his spear. Uh, Kuli Talik then asks uh, Oki if he would like to eat some eggs. He accepts what Kuli Talik has offered him so Oki and his gang well, eat eggs with Kuli Talik's family. Now if you look at this from a symbolic perspective, we're technically seeing the bird of prey eating an egg. Now if this was a bird of prey eating its own offspring in an egg, well, that would be very wrong in the moral sense. And we can sort of guess that this is the breaking point of uh, Oki's morals. We've uh, earlier on, we've already seen a sharp decline in his morals, and this is just a further breaking point in him uh, losing his morality in a sense and sort of letting evil influence him. Later on in the scene, Kuli Talik offers, well, he says to Oki that he can eat more eggs, but Oki says he's stuffed. So this sort of represents that Oki has, his desire to kill Atanarjwa has sort of stopped for an instant or for the moment being and he will not pursue Atanarjwa any further in order to kill him. The symbolism in this scene will be discussed a bit more in the next section. The central theme that I was able to come up with states that one must attempt to defeat evil if it has possessed one of their peers. A failure to do so will result in others being influenced by evil ways which can lead to tragic consequences. We have to understand that this movie is based off a really old Inuit legend and its theme wasn't created or wasn't intended for teenage boys of the 21st century. Now this theme isn't that very good of a theme, mostly because it's very narrow and it can't be applied to everyone. Then again, this is based off a legend. I believe that this theme is more harmful than helpful if you're considering our society in general. There are many people who do not believe in spiritual values and the fact of one being possessed by evil, well, could throw some people off. However, this theme could be very helpful if you're someone who does believe in spiritual values. A good way to modify this theme would be to change the aspect of the person possessed by evil to something that's more applicable to people in our society who do who do not believe in spiritual va spiritual values, but I'm not sure if there's a way to do that. Now you can't really accuse this film of intentionally portraying Hollywood Indian stereotypes mostly because uh, the director Zacharias Kronuk was born and raised in Nunavut. I'm pretty sure most of the actors are of native descent and um, the cinematographer Norman Cohn was, well he spent uh, parts of his life in Nunavut. So I believe that most of the people who worked in this film, well basically all of them, they hold uh, the appropriate roles and uh, they're all of native descent and they know their culture pretty well so you can't really say that they're intentionally portraying uh, stereotypes but rather portraying reality. So one so-called stereotype that most people think that this film might portray is um, the savage, just the savage in general. You see uh, the people there eating raw meat and um, uh, you also see uh, they don't really have proper dental care and usually their faces are covered in snot. But then again, they didn't really have the resources to 
uh, treat any of these problems. So it's if you think they're savage, it's not really their fault. You can't blame it on them. Another so-called stereotype that viewers might see is the noble savage in uh, Atanarjwat. He is the hero of this film and um, particularly in the scene where uh, you see him burst out of his tent when uh, Oki is trying to kill him and run away, he uh, happens to be doing it naked. Now some people uh, look at this as heroic and um, some people might look at this as a bit savage which in a sense when combined together portrays the noble savage stereotype. Then again, you can't really accuse that of being a portrayal of the noble savage stereotype. This story, the story of this film is based off an old Inuit legend and if it's based off an old Inuit legend, you can't really accuse this legend of portraying modern day stereotypes of native people. The only real purpose of this portrayal is an attempt to show the harsh living conditions of the native people back then. There's not much else to say about the acting except that it was really well done. It felt really authentic. Um, not really because the actors seemed really well polished and trained at a drama school, but rather that they knew their people very well and they knew this legend very well. And by knowing this content very well, they, they were able to portray the character characters very realistically. There's one exception to this, and uh, that would be when Pooja dis is discovered cheating on Atanarjwa. She begins crying in this so-called crying seems a bit fake. There aren't even any real tears. Enough said. The dialogue in this film didn't really have any bad lines, but it didn't really have too much that was special. The dialogue was just about average, although there were some funny jokes shown at some parts. <laughs> so to put this all in conclusion, I believe that this movie did a very good job at not portraying any Hollywood Indian stereotypes. Uh, it, its theme seemed a bit shaky and it doesn't really seem applicable to most people in today's society. However, it was really well acted and uh, I found the cinematography to be very stunning at times but it got a bit uh, boring and repetitive uh, at some times and um, I'll give this film a 7 out of 10. Yeah. Thanks for watching.